of my most impressive cases, uh, I call it the case of the shrinking bullet. You know, it was just mystifying, baffling, and it baffled the Lexington, Kentucky police, who thought they were pretty much onto it, but there was a fly in the ointment, and there was part of it that just couldn't be uh, brought to bear. And I've always, I've been a detective with the uh, Pinkertons, and uh, you know, done all kinds of detective work of various kinds and knew a lot of forensics and I had a forensic friend I would often speak at forensic conferences about things like the Shroud of Turin or the Will West case some cases that I did bring new clarity to and we were fat both of us uh, fascinated by this case and at one conference one of the Kentucky people said I'm sure if you'd like to take a look into this case you'd be very welcome because it's just you know gone nowhere it's a cold case and you know very difficult so we thought yeah we'll we'll look into that so what it was was the case of a man named Jean-Michel Gambe he was a, a horse breeder uh, Kentucky horseman and uh, he began to uh, act strangely and uh, one day he started he told his little girls that he was going to go buy them a puppy and he went off, but he told a lot of people that somebody was following him in a black car, um, that he was afraid that something might happen. And then he's found uh, farmers come running to where his car's pulled off in a little off-the-road spot out in the middle of nowhere, out in the country. And uh, the car's on fire, burning up, and Mr. Gambay's, uh, as we find, was shot through the head and burned up in his own car. Lying outside the car was a pistol, eventually shown to have been his pistol, but with one shot fired. And so what happened? Well, there was not any evidence that another car was seen. People converged on the scene and, and uh, just his car. And he was seen sitting there for some time by himself, no other car turned out that he had, on the way there, apparently stopped at Rainbow Oil Company and bought a can of kerosene. And that I mentioned that was his gun and that he lied to his little girls because he said he was going to go buy them a puppy. He had no intention, never went in that direction, but he took his pistol and took it with him. Turns out, as we investigated this, that Mr. Gambe had was about a million dollars in debt and he had secretly taken out a life insurance policy which would um, pay except for suicide would pay off that million dollars turned out that he had said and we had access to all these uh, files from the police the police were very open um, evidence room anything I wanted we had my friend lived in Florida so it was me doing most of this but uh, I was you know, able to, to do the yeoman's work. And so the, the detectives had interviewed people and he had told his friend, uh, sometimes I think if it weren't for my wife and kids, I'd just blow my head off. And so we began to see, as the police had seen, some evidence for what's called, um, through what's called a psychological autopsy, uh, wasn't done formally, I later did, formally, um, and you could see the man was sort of a walking case of somebody who was about ready to kill himself and maybe fake it and make it look like someone had murdered him. At this point, um, the forensic anthropologist reassembling the exploded skull and the bones found the bullet hole in the eye socket. What, what the gunshot had been through the eye and out the thick part of the back of the head. The bullet was never recovered. It went into the countryside and was never found. What was interesting was that the exit wound was large and consistent with the 38. It was maybe about a 45 caliber or something like that. The bullet expands and so forth. But the entrance wound, that bullet hole, was about 25 caliber. And you can't get a 38 bullet in a little 
20-some caliber hull. We call this the case of the shrinking bullet. So either this case is all wrong or there is something we don't understand at all. At one point, I asked the police commander, Drexel Neal, uh, if we could go to the evidence room, and I wanted to really study that pistol. And I said, Did, was it tested for blowback? That's if you shoot yourself like this, uh, vitreous fluid, blood, and so forth will spatter out onto the gun. He said, yes, we had that tested at the state police crime lab. And I said, the results? And he said, it was negative for blowback. And I said, well, I want to see the pistol. I picked up this charred pistol and looked down the barrel like this and I could see these little tadpole shaped streaks all down the barrel, all around it and onto the cylinder. And I turned it around and pointed it right into the detective commander's face and I said, Drexel, look down this, and, and I started pointing and he went like this. We sent it to the lab and, and we looked at the lab report and it said tested for blowback and it was typed in a space negative and I said but but what did he do to test I said I'll bet you he just was so busy with so many things overworked he just swabbed this with a swab and gave it a phenolphthalein test or something to change color turn blue and it, that would show blood didn't do anything done next case that's the way these labs are often done. And I said, but you and I can see these charred little, and I had my loop out and was looking, and, and he said, you want the gun? And I said, well, I think my friend needs to be seized. So we arranged to have it sent from Lexington police to my friend's um, jurisdiction, and then we could have it to play with, but it would still be in custody of the police. It was just a technicality. And so I went down and we worked on this together. And meanwhile, we had found in the literature that there was one other case in, I believe it was Boston, where a similar case of the bullet was too large for the bullet hole, and yet in this case, it was a certainty that this gun made that hole because they grabbed it out of the killer's hand when he shot a guy, and it was absolutely accounted for. And I called the Boston Examiner and I said, Can, he said, absolutely, that's true. That happened and we have no explanation for it. And I said, what do you think might have happened? And he said, well, we don't have an explanation. We wondered if the, the sharp edge of the bone had sort of sliced off some of the soft lead bullet and you're thinking, I don't think so, but we don't have a better hypothesis, right? And, you know, people, there were people saying, oh, this was a murder after all, and, uh, and the anthropologist said a man cannot shoot himself like this while set, after setting himself on fire, change, his, change, put the gun in the other hand and throw it out the car window. Well, that wasn't what happened, but you see, if people hadn't really looked at the crime scene photos and misunderstood the position, he was in fact, only his upper part was lying in the car seat. His knees were out on the ground. It would have been very simple as the police had worked out for him to have pressed against the open door, leaned forward, shot himself, the gun would drop and be found where we found it. His body would slump forward into the car if he had previously doused it with kerosene, which wouldn't explode and would be perfect, and his body would burn. And as corroboration, we found that, and it took us a while to find what was the case of this, but the kerosene can cap was found under the body, which meant the kerosene went down before the body, not the opposite if a killer did it and then doused the body. So this was a very complex case and difficult, you see. And what we did was to realize that, and mostly my forensic friend did a lot of the genius work. I was, I was doing yeoman's work. And we found that both, of, both our case and that of the Boston Examiner were an unusual type of bullet wound, a bullet hole, called a keyhole lesion. And that is, instead of a round hole, it's a sort of roundish hole with a wedge shape, kind of like an old-fashioned keyhole and that it was 
known pretty well that whenever you saw a keyhole you knew the bullet had entered here and knocked loose this wedge and we decided uh, we had a, a bit of a theory let's just see if we can do that and we used a duplicate Smith & Wesson revolver a deer skull and put the the gun obliquely that thin thin uh, cartilaginous uh, uh, bone it, brittle bone wouldn't work thick bone wouldn't work it had to be eye socket type thing so we recreated that and we produced with a 38 caliber pistol a 27 caliber hole it was remarkable and what we think happened pretty sure is that as the bullet the nose of the bullet made the started to make the initial smaller hole then it it was springy the bone opened as the wedge was blown loose stress fractures and it allowed the large bullet to go through and snap back and in any case we could duplicate it and we published a scientific article on that in a science forensic journal and we wrote a full case study of all of this and as a consequence the police saw, marked that case closed solved and closed and I was persona grata whenever I wanted to come to the police so they were quite happy to get warrants against a bogus spiritualist who have defrauded people and they called me in on another case recommended me to a family on still another one and I really really uh, took to uh, homicide detective work like a duck to water. <laughs>